Baruch Hashem, I got to tell you something. You you maybe noticed it. Did you notice that it very proudly says Besiata the Shmaya? Yes, there is a base on Machtalat on the plane. It That's does. not a joke. And people say, It's pretty cool. <laughs> what? Is that a joke? And, and we say very, very, very proudly, and I point it out, you know, wherever we go, to Jews and non Jews alike, that it stands for with God's help, with Hashem's help. And I learned this from my father in Queens, Atzala. On one side, it would say, Be'ezra Hashem. And on the other side, it would say, Besiata the Shmaya. So a guy said to my father once, let me ask you a question, Mr. Rowe. Really? You got to point, you got to paint that on the airplane? He said, let me tell you a secret. If our patients would know how much Siata the Shmaya our members need, they wouldn't call Hatzalah. <laughs> <laughs> we just, everything we do. Do you, do, you do, do you turn left or do you turn right? Every move you do, I tell people, our airplanes, honestly, and I mean this and I believe this from my core, our airplanes do not get off the ground if Hashem doesn't want them to. Nothing we do happens without Hashem wanting it to. Thank you for clicking on this episode of the Meaningful People podcast featuring Ellie Rowe from Hatsala Air. Wow. An amazing episode, um, a long one, but filled with gems, so many stories. You know, the timeline of really basic Hatsala of how it came to be. The story is so inspiring. And then Hatsala Air. So stay tuned for every single part of this episode. It's so amazing. I want to mention our friends who sponsored this episode at Albert and Associates. You know, it's yump to season and that could come with a lot of financial stress, which may be the reason you need a financial planner in your corner. You know, I was with Moshe the other day and he told me that he's been getting a lot of calls from people about, you know, taxes, tax questions. And he's not a tax advisor. He's not an accountant. But as a financial planner, he's been trained to give basic tax advice. And him and his team have found proper ways that you can save on taxes, which means more money in your pocket, which means more money for your son, Shlaimi which means that Shlaimi can buy more things and maybe you could even give more tzedakah. It all, it all is an avalanche of good things that happen when you choose Albert and Associates. So go ahead and send them an email today at albertmosha at gmail.com or call them at 718-644-1594 and you can get a free consultation. So you lose nothing by reaching out. And like I said, Shlaimi gets more money in his pocket. That means maybe he could buy a shirt from Collars & Co. You know, and I thought I was the biggest Collars & Co fan. Like I wear this all the time. I'm wearing it right now. But I saw someone else who's a bigger fan of Collars Co. than me even. And that is Gabe Tenenberg. How are you, Gabe Tenenberg from FM Home Loans? You might know him as Mortgage Gabe. Well, he is one of the biggest Collars Co. fans out there. He wears it wherever he goes, every meeting, every Shabbos. And I said to him, Gabe, you know what? You need your own promo code because you represent it a lot better than I could sometimes. And that's why we have a promo code for Gabe Tenenberg that is MM Gabe for 20% off any order over $150. And let me tell you something. And Gabe might not be able to lower the interest rates right now in the real estate market, but he could save you money on some shirts. So go to collarsandco.com, use promo code MMGabe for 20% off any order over $150. Look at this shirt I'm wearing right now. It is amazing. Rosh Hashanah is coming up. You want to make sure you're in shul and davening and having an amazing Yom Naraim. And to do that, sometimes you need to feel a little just comfortable. And you wear a shirt from Collars & Co. It feels so smooth, so amazing, so silk. The collar makes you look good. So go to collarsandco.com, reach out to them today. I just wanted to mention, I wanted to say a big thank you to all of you because when you support our advertisers, you are directly supporting our podcast. Um, you are directly making sure that we can create more content. So I'm so happy to just welcome new friends to this podcast, like OK Clarity, like Aim Higher that you'll hear from in this episode, Swing It, which by the way, I got a swing set from Swing It. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable how quickly that went up and how easy the process was to deal with them. So, but you'll hear about that later from me. For now, enjoy this episode with Ellie Rowe. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Ellie Rowe, thank you so much for, for taking your time. Right. In order to get him to shut his phones and his walk and his and his radio, it was like it was an avoid. Was an but the iPad's on. So we have one thing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The phone is on. It's just on mute. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, for joining us here on Meaningful People. Really appreciate you taking the time. And um, obviously we're gonna discuss a lot about Hatsala Air, how how it got started, what what is Hatsala Air. Um, I'm sure there are many people who do know. I'm sure there are some people who don't. And if you don't, then that's great. They never had to use them. And 
you know, good for them. Um, but let's peel it back, I guess, you know, way, way, way back, maybe the beginning of your life. You're you're involved in a lot of chesed work, a lot of Hatzala stuff, um, whether it's regular Hatzala or Hatzala air. Um, was there an influence in your life or something that came to, you know, impact those things, like to influence that? So, uh, you know, yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I think um, I didn't really have a choice. You know, um, I'm 54. What? Born in the 60s. I, I know, right? I look like I'm uh, 22. My wife says I'm uh, 14 with 40 years of experience. I was going to say, you're like, <laughs> I was like 64. But oh, yeah, 64. 20, okay, I'm, I look good for 64, though, right? Play. <laughs> so um, we came, we moved, to, uh, we moved to America from London at uh, eight years old. So I'm British. Could you tell by my accent? No. I sound like Interesting. I'm from, and you have I, good teeth. I sound like I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> exactly right. No one, <laughs> no one in London does. <laughs> I sound like I'm from Brooklyn, but I never lived there. Well, anyway, so at eight years old, um, we move into Kew Gardens in Queens. And uh, the first weekend we're there, my father walks into shul and there's a little sign that says, does anybody want to start hot salah in Queens? And my father in 1977 says, what's hot salah? And there's a little sign that says, contact Mechel Handler. Now, Mechel Handler, actually, yeah. do you know who he is? He's the founder. He's like the, the founder, founder, founder of Atzala, right? He's actually not. Whoa, no, no, no. That, that's Weber. Heschel Weber. We so, can talk about him in a minute. Yeah, okay. But, but he's, he was the executive director for many, many years. I mean, he had tremendous, tremendous um, credit for the unbelievable growth that Hatzalah had, both in New York and in the world. Well, anyway, he was learning in a yeshiva in Flatbush, and he was a Hatzalah member in Flatbush. But his parents lived in Kew Gardens, and selfishly, he wanted to make sure that his parents would have Hatzalah. So he puts in a little sign, does anybody want to start Hatzalah in Queens? My father, I think, was a bit of a frustrated doctor. And he's like, what's Hatzala? So Mechel tells him about it. Today, I should really call him Rabbi Handler. He's, mm. a, he's a Rosh Kail and a tremendous Tamil Chacham, wrote lots of Svarim. He's an amazing, amazing man. And um, so he tells my father. My father says, I'm in. And that's what happened. He started Hatzala in 1977. In London? So, no, in, 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 in Queens. Oh, Queens, pay yeah. attention there, Nachi. <laughs> well, we, we just flew for thousand <laughs> miles. So uh, he starts Hatzala in Queens. And... You know, people today take Hatzalah for granted. They just think, sure. you know, we call Hatzalah ambulances, paramedics, EMTs, etc. Then there were no, nothing. There was no EMTs. There was no equipment. He was the first EMT with a couple of guys. And he started Queens Hatzalah, which today is one of the really large Hatzalah organizations in the world. And, um, and that's what I saw. I saw our garage was turned into, uh, you know, a storage place for all the different equipment. And every night he would come back from working and he would have a table filled with orders for equipment and member interviews and everything he did was a volunteer. And this is what I saw since I was eight years old, a house of chesed, a house of, uh, of uh, Hatzala, and a house of just um, putting others before yourself. So definitely not my fault, mm. anything I do today. <laughs> how, old are you, my... how old are you when you when you yourself joined Hatzala? So probably if I was eight when I moved, probably about eight years old, I must have had like lights oh, yeah. and sirens on my bicycle. Or like and, uh, a service unit? <laughs> it was definitely a service unit. I would go the with The barriers my, to entry weren't I, as formal. <laughs> well, it was formal. At eight years old, I had an application process. I had to say, Daddy, can I join Atzala? <laughs> and, um, and there I was. But yeah, I mean, I literally remember um, stocking oxygen bags for the new members at, at before my bar mitzvah and trauma bags and all different types of kits. So it's not fair. I grew up in a world of chesed, both my mother and my father. I, um, I'm the second, you know, I, I'm a real middle child. I have an older brother who's of course spoiled because he's the number one and I have a baby. Is he Do Dovey? Do no, Dovey's Dovey my father, Do oh. Yitzchak Rowe from Queens. Yeah. And I have a baby brother, AJ, AJ Rowe. He's a king of chesed and uh, he's in Israel and Ramad Eshkol. And I have an only sister. So they're all, you know, they all got spoiled on their own right. Yeah. And, and I had a, so which like, part isn't fair? He said it's not fair. Well, it's not fair that I was the middle child stuck oh. right in the middle <laughs> over there. But I had to, uh, um, you know, fight I my I thought way. you meant that it's not fair that you got so much chesed. attention. Amazing, no, exposure. Uh, you know, there's such a predisposition to chesed. It's usually people have to develop that. That, 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 that is true. I, I, I literally every single day of my life and my home saw chesed at, you know, at uh, um, unparalleled levels. It was uh, impressive and, and exciting at the same time. Well, anyway, at um, 18, I became an EMT. That was the youngest age to become an EMT. Nice. And off I went to Israel. And um, EMTs do about 80 hours of training. And um, at the time, I just wasn't 
I wasn't satisfied with just being an EMT with 80 hours of training. So what we ended up happening is um, I looked into becoming a paramedic. And um, do you know Shia Farkas? Shia I see Farkas. Shia Farkas over there. How and, are you over there? And, and actually, Shia Farkas is an, in, is an incredibly talented paramedic. For um, anyone listening, someone is actually walking into the studio <laughs> as we speak in real time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually funny. How are you? And Shia, perhaps you could tell us where, where you came from today? Yeah, go so go, it won't come up on the mic unless, yeah, yeah. Go, go, unless go, by, go by Ellie. Go by Ellie. Come pull up a chair. This is, it's going to look staged, but it's not. No, it's totally not. <laughs> it, it, it's, it actually won't look staged because we are not prepared for this. No. <laughs> You're not prepared. So this is a little souvenir. Oh, thank you. That uh, that Shia brought oh. from, oh. from from Cincinnati. We can wear this even though we don't know how to fly, right? Well, you know, when you put that on, it's not crew. it's not how you fly. It's how you it's how you look. Wow. Yeah. So it's like skiing. You know, the guys in, yeah. the, in the ski valet. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, get on over. Get on over. Shia, why don't you say hello and uh, and uh, tell everybody what happened today and um, how prepared you were for this uh, conversation right now. I was not prepared at all. <laughs> like an ice cream cone, right into the mic. It's uh, like an ice cream cone. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> um, that we had a uh, we had a uh, difficult case today, and uh, and Baruch Hashem, the patient arrived safely in Cincinnati. So you flew from from New York to Cincinnati this morning. Uh, you called me last night at a chasana at about uh, was ten o'clock at night. Out and said, "Can you uh, fly? Can you fly six a.m. to uh, Cincinnati this morning?" And uh, he put a team together, uh, an excellent team, um, a pedi- um, neonatologist, a respiratory therapist, and I came along for the ride. <laughs> That's really wow. incredible! Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for for stopping by. Like that was totally, by the way, everyone who's listening, <laughs> totally not not scripted, not planned. Thank uh, you for flying into the studio. Yeah, thank you for the yeah. work you do. Really, thank you so much. You know, Shia, we recognize you have a choice in air travel, and appreciate you putting your life and your trust <laughs> in our hands. But it's funny that you that you the way you tell that story. I think when you and I first met, Ellie, um, thank you to Morty Chop for introducing us to each other. Oh, that's right, on Shabbos. That, that Shabbos, he hosted Sh- a kiddish. Shout out to Willa Woods. Yes, indeed. And I, I got to run. But, thank uh, you thank you so much yeah. appreciate it safe trip <laughs> and we we met at a kiddish and it was awesome to meet you there and i think that morning that shabbos morning you also were traveling doing chesed that shabbos morning if i remember correctly it could be i actually don't remember <laughs> the, the day so um you know that, that's it's actually one of my problems in life when somebody goes on a flight with us it's such an impactful meaningful moment of their life it could be a meaningful high it could be a meaningful low and but it's always impactful so they look at me and if i'm on the plane or if she is on the plane or any one of us are on the plane and they will never forget us ever right it's like one of them it's like a very crucial moment in their life and they're sharing it with you guys not a very crucial for many it could be the most impactful or the most crucial moment in their life and we're there, right? So, you know, I can think back to this Pesach when a lady broke her back in Panama, a young lady from Brooklyn. She was ATVing with her family, and it was, in their words, the most colorful, happy afternoon. And the ATV rolled over backwards and broke her back in multiple places. And they were told her in Panama that she may never walk again. And she called up, you know, uh, I think it was... Baruch Be'er Bender from Machiaza. Yeah. I don't know if you know who he is. An, sure. amazing, an amazing guy who arranged... Pillar of the Five Towns community here. I had no idea who no he is. Yeah. <laughs> no clue. And, uh, and who arranged them specialists. And uh, they said, no, you know, fly back to New York. Within four hours, we were airborne to go pick her up. Now, I see the husband and he comes over to me and he's like, you don't remember me? <laughs> and I'm like, nope. And I really don't because to us, we were treating, flying, you know, flight planning, doing everything that we do. And then, you know, here we go. And it becomes an impactful moment um, in their lives. So I want to bring you back. You had mentioned before she walked in, you said that you weren't so satisfied with just being an EMT as a young child. So sort of what, what, uh, what, what transpired after that? So um, I decided to become a paramedic, right? um, Which, you know, today is a 
pretty popular in the world of Hatzala. Back then, um, almost didn't exist. There was literally less than a, a handful of paramedics in the entire Hatzala system. And we're talking 1990. I became uh, one of New York City's youngest paramedics. I was, uh, you know, all of 21 years old. And by definition, <laughs> by definition, you have to flex. be an EMT. Yeah, there's a little flex there. But <laughs> by definition, you have to be an EMT in order to become a paramedic. And at the time, I think you needed about a year's experience. And I was also in Israel learning. So um, I created the Advanced Life Support Division for Queens, where we had a really at the time, write our own protocols. And we had to get um, modulators and demodulators to send EKGs through telemetry units in the hospitals. There was so much um, that we needed to do and it was such an uphill battle, but we were able to do many, many things that a doctor can do in an emergency room and for the first time bring that emergency room to the field in Queens. So things like pacemakers, external pacemakers, yeah. and IVs and all types of medications, and really, you know, do needle cricothyroidotomies if somebody has a, a blockage or, or decompression of the chest, you know, the equivalent of a, of a field version of a chest tube, things like that, which EMTs couldn't do. You really, it, it, it opens things up like like crazy. I, I I happen to I was an EMT for a bit. Oh, I, so you know what I'm was, talking about. When I was when I was 18, I took an EMT course, Benny Fogel and Bar Park. There you go. He was actually my student in yeah. uh, at New York Hospital of Queens. So it was me and like then. 18 Hasidim, um, and so uh, 19 Hasidim, yeah. <laughs> Hawaii over there. <laughs> so yeah, it was really it was great. I was an EMT for like three four years, but in the five towns you had to be married to be on at solo, so I didn't really like I like, missed that boat. Um, I know someone who knows someone. I, well, I didn't know you then. <laughs> That's it. And I'm and I got a refresh now for my course. But but the difference between just for the listeners, it's like the role of an EMT really is try to stabilize, but get them to the hospital as fast as possible. A medic, really, from my understanding, you you could do a lot of treatment. Like right. So so we we won't treat chronic conditions right. like um you know cancers and and uh, things that need uh, a a lot of many hours of treatment but really for the most part the predominant amount of emergencies like unconscious diabetics where we start ivs and give sugars yeah or you know cardiac dysrhythmias where we can actually do you know give medications or cardiac arrests we don't run in any anymore it used to be you would scoop and run now everything that they do in the hospital in a cardiac arrest for the most part the paramedics do and and it's pretty impressive that hatzala today has a true two-tiered system right, of first responder BLS and uh, advanced life support, the paramedics that are really now in every Hatzala. And I think maybe Especially that- with these ambulances, these buses look like hospitals. Yeah. Right, they it's are. Incredible. Yeah, and I, and I've, I've done my my, uh, my rotations on, a, like, I don't want to say which company, like other ambulances, not you Hatzala. You could say. They're tiny. Yeah. Like, they're tiny. Right. Oh, some of the little vans. The yeah. little, like, it's so claustrophobic. Hatzala really ha put, like, they really have those. Have you, see, have you seen the Queens trucks, the big yellow ones? That the yellow have ones. Queens? I heard they're expensive. So, so <laughs> today, you know, when we started, they were- um, I think under a hundred thousand dollars. So the first ambulance. This is a cute little anecdotal story on the side. Um, my father went and bought the first ambulance for Queens Hotel in 1982. Wow. It's a great story, and it was a uh, a used um, brawn from a, a dealer underneath the BQE. There was a truck dealer there. I think it was called Bruno Truck Sales at the time. There was always a sign when you went up the BQE, and um, somebody said to him, "Why don't you go to Eugene Gluck, who's?" owns Armatron. Have you heard of Armatron watches? Very yeah. big watch company. And Eugene Gluck was a, a very famous, very, very generous philanthropist living in Forest Hills Gardens. Is, so, is Eugene Gluck Sweet Gluck's father? No. No, no, that's What's Rabbi Edgar Gluck. Different. Edgar. Edgar yeah. and Eugene are interchangeable. So they're pretty much <laughs> they're pretty much the same. Okay, people. I hear they both start with an E and the last Have you ever seen Gluck. them both in the same room? I don't know. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> well anyway, so uh <laughs> so um somebody says go to Eugene Gluck. So a, a fellow by the name of Simcha Gleish. So he takes my father to Eugene Gluck and he walks in and he tells him all about Hatzala. And he says, this is amazing. What do you guys need? So he said, listen, we're buying our first ambulance. It was $25,000 at the time. So he said, I'd love to help you. And he takes out a checkbook and he writes a check for $12,500, which today would be the equivalent, you know, if the ambulance is a 400,000, let's say the equivalent of uh, 200,000, you know, writing $180,000 check. Really? And he calls his wife, her name was Jean, Eugene and Jean, I'm not making this up, and calls, <laughs> calls his wife and says, Jean, let me tell you about 
this organization, meet this guy, Dove Rowe, and, uh, and look what we're doing. So she hears about it, life-saving rescue in Queens, you know, to, to help the, the Queens community. And he says, so they're buying their first ambulance, it's $25,000, and we gave them 12 and a half thousand. So she says to her husband, Eugene, can I speak a little Yiddish for two seconds? I'll translate. Sure. Eugene, hasta shetif in the business? Do wow. you have a partner in the business? He says, no. So she says, favus daf sashitif in the ambulance. Wow. So what do you part. need? <laughs> what do you need a partner for in the donation yeah. for an ambulance? He says, you know what? You're right. And he rips up the twelve and a half thousand dollar check, and he hands my father a twenty five thousand dollar check. Wow! And, and he says, "I want to be, I want to be in the, the first ambulance." And that was unbelievable. Now, what's even more unbelievable is every eight years or so, because that's the the half life or what we call the life of a of an ambulance. Serious. He kept replacing it, and the second time it was a hundred thousand, then it was one hundred and eighty, and then it was two fifty, and now they're about four hundred thousand. And I think he gave four or five ambulances over the wow. last, maybe more, maybe six ambulances. That's really special. It's really nice. I want to highlight the the role that his wife played in that. Gene, the the wisdom, yeah, the chachmas nashim ban sabesa that she pushed him to to see that the same way he doesn't have a partner that he needs to take this on himself. That's Brilliant. number one. And number two, how he could have just wrote another check for 12 and a half, but he didn't do that. He ripped up the first check and he said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to write a check for the whole amount. And I, I bet you that impacted what happened the next time, because if it's just, oh, I'll, I'll contribute towards it, it. It's not with that sense of achrayas, with that sense of responsibility that this is our project and the partnership, I would just reframe. He did have a partner in that chesed and that was his wife. You know what? Mm -hmm. I, I've often thought about that story, but never looked at it with that clarity. I think you're hundred percent right. That's Momo for you. <laughs> and 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 to be able to recognize, the, you know, the the beauty in tzedakah, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But people say, "Oh, you give up your night, you give up this." No way. I think when any Hatzalah person gives up, it's not just them; it's their whole family. I need to tell you guys that as I'm thinking and listening to you talk about the partnership between husband and wife, most people, you know, go over to Hatzalah guy in Flatbush or Mexico or Australia or South Africa and they go, wow, thank you for saving my life. But you can ask any of my family members on a Friday night when I'm out on a Hatzalah call, whether it's a flight or whether it's just going from call to call in Queens or Israel or wherever I am. My family doesn't make Kiddush, and it could be till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning wow. until I walk into the house. When the kids were little, the kids used to eat, and my wife would wait up. So it's it's really, it's a family experience. And in this case, with Jean and Eugene, yeah. as a family, and she, the Chachmas Nashim, like you say, you know, dictated that role, it's it's fascinating, and yet so impressive at the same time to watch how, how many people, you know, uh, partake in the selfless act of chesed. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Okay, so if we're being honest right now, which we always got to do, as the summer is ending and Shana is approaching, I think that it's safe to say that we're all having a sense of anxiety. Uh, you can feel it in the air. This is the time when many of us go back to therapy if we took a summer break, or it's the time where we reach back out to a coach or nutritionist who kept us on track throughout our goals throughout the year. But what if you don't have already a trusted wellness professional in your corner. So I'm a firm believer, I'm a big believer, that it's never too late to start getting healthier, happier, and more healed. And fortunately, there is an incredible company out there called okclarity.com that agrees with me. Finally, somebody agrees with me. okclarity.com is like an upscale version of ZocDoc for the Jewish world. It's the place for any Jew to find an excellent therapist, psychiatrist, nutritionist, or coach, and it's completely free to use. Every professional on OKClarity.com is vetted and experienced in working with the Jewish community so they understand our specific mental health struggles and the pressures that we experience, which are unique struggles, to be honest. What I love about OKClarity is how they get us millennials and Gen Zs. They get that reaching out to a wellness professional can be tough, so they do their best to make it super simple. Their impressive directory allows you to search and filter on your own, or you can simply complete a short form, and their specialist will recommend a great professional for you all anonymous and free. 
Also, if you're not already following OK Clarity on Instagram, you definitely want to because they host Instagram live sessions almost every single weeknight where different experts discuss pressing mental health and wellness topics and answer community questions all anonymously and for free. You get the theme here. It's all free. It's amazing. Last but not least, if you have WhatsApp, OK Clarity has an incredible WhatsApp status with over 8,000 obsessed followers. And yes, I am one of them. Their WhatsApp is a free way to improve your mental health and they post the best humor too. So you'll get a good laugh. Side note, if you're listening to this and you are a wellness professional and don't yet have a presence on okclarity.com, my question for you is, what do you have for breakfast? No, I'm kidding. My question is, why not? I don't understand. This is the place to be if you want to stay relevant in the coming months, years, and decades. And it's the place to be if you want to help the people who need you. Well, we'll put the links in the description in the show notes of this episode. Smash those links. You won't regret it. Okclarity.com is there for you. Now it's time to use their services. I love how you framed it as well. You, you called it a family experience, not a family sacrifice. Um, I think people knee jerk to label it as a sacrifice, but I love the way that you're framing it, that it's, it's a family experience and not a sacrifice. It's something that your family gets to do and experience. And there's the, there's the partner that's on the front lines, and then there's the partner that has a different role, but is sharing in that experience. Listen, there's only two people in this world. That's it. There are two people in this world, givers and takers. You know, we're just starting our chat, but I'll, I feel like I'm friends with you and I'll tell you a little secret about what I do every morning. At my age, I got to go to the bathroom when I wake up every morning, right? <laughs> Same here. I just do. It's crazy. And I'm I got to like, tell you something What else. is going on, God? In, in, Why? In, in my, hey, just give me 10 minutes. Uh, I did yesterday. No, I got to go. Yeah. And and uh, I got to check my WhatsApps. I, I instinctively lean over. But before I go to the bathroom and before I check my WhatsApps, wherever I am in the world, and it's often that I'm in a different city from day to day to day. It could be in Salt Lake City. A friend of mine was skiing um, in Salt Lake City and went off a cliff and tumbled and broke many, many of his bones. And we flew in and I'm in Salt Lake City in the, in the, you know, in the snow. Or we can be in Manchester. We took a, a girl in a horrible state from, from Manchester you know, to, to New York and you're in the fog, right? I mean, yeah. has it ever not been foggy or rainy in Manchester? You know, we're in Miami all the time doing extractions from Miami. I'm in the sun. But every morning I do the same routine. I go to the window and I look up and I say, Hashem, these words, and you can, you can do it. I say, Hashem, there's only two people in this world, givers and takers. I beg you, let me be a giver today. Goodbye. And then I take care of what I got to do. And I have to tell you something, every single day when you go about your life, it is not, it is not, as, we, as, as you said, Mo, it's not a challenge to be a giver. It's a bracha to be able to give. It's a blessing. And you got to beg Hashem to be able to go and do this. You know, in two weeks, we have September 11th coming up. Now, September 11th, every year is very meaningful for everybody, right? I mean, super impactful for, for everybody. But for Hatzalah members, it's particularly impactful because we had hundreds of guys at Ground Zero. I just met one of them last night. I met Chaskel Bennett last night by a wedding. Chaskel was there? Yeah. Hundreds of guys. Now, my brother is one of those hundreds, and he's, he was a coordinator in Queens Hatzalah for many years, an exceptional guy who puts chesed in the community before himself and his family. He's just a true role model. And he was crushed. And one by one, Hatzala members were hurt and Hatzala members were injured and Hatzala members were saved, but none died. Wow. And we had uh, afterwards, there was, you know, during difficult, f during difficult emergencies, there's often a debriefing. And we had Rav Matas Yahweh Solomon, the uh, mashkiach of Lakewood, came and spoke with us. And he said, it's interesting, now we're coming up on uh, on the Aseris Yimei on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. One of the Avinu Malkanos, he said, makes no sense. Which one is that? You guys want to take a guess at it? He says, Avinu Malkanu, Kasvenu Besefez Chuyos, right? Write us in the Book of Merits. He said, how does that make sense? Write us in the Book, Kasvenu Besefer, Slicha Mechila, forgive us. Parnasa v'chakala, give us us, you know, business, give us cash, give us parnasa. But zchuyos, you either have it or you don't have it. What's the kasveinu b'sei v'zchuyos? So he said, Hatzalah members are chosen by Hashem to get invited to go and do a chesed. And when you do that, you have the biggest opportunity to help somebody in need. There's nothing like that. And if the need knocks on your door, you say thank you for being able to be a giver today. And that's... That's what we do every day. 
That's really amazing. I'm curious um, if you can take me through the process of, of how Hatzalah Air became, came to be. Uh, you went from being an EMT to being a medic, and then imagine it wasn't like overnight because it's all area is a you know fairly new organization but like how'd that happen so um perhaps we can just backtrack and sure. and, and and talk about the uh, metamorphosis of yes, the world of Hatzala. metamorphosis that's a big word for yeshiva boy no let's <laughs> let's metamorphosize <laughs> let's meta- metamorphosize okay is that a word i don't know but uh, it could be Excellent. i use it's more it of a sometimes. process than right. a word it's a process yes I guess this is a process. We're <laughs> going to go from the beginning of Hatzalah through now. Yeah. But um, so Hatzalah, if we backtrack, you we, you just jump right into 1977. But I'm I'm a boy from the 60s. Yeah. I'm from the sum, I'm from the summer of 69. I'm born in uh, July of 69. So um, let's go back to 1969. Yeah. Um, and really how Hatzalah started, because um, for those who know it, it's amazing to hear. But for those who don't know it, it's fascinating, and it shows you how every one of us has the ability to change the world. I believe that. I believe that every single one of us and every listener has the ability. You need to be able to dream and you need to be able to have a vision and then realize your vision. And here's what happens. 1969, a guy by the name of Herschel Weber, who's Baruch Hashem alive and around today, he's in Williamsburg and a friend of his grabs his chest and he starts to sweat and have chest pains and having shortness of breath. And he says, I need to help you. So his friend says, call an ambulance, please. But of course, he didn't have a phone over there, so he goes outside to a payphone. You guys know what a payphone is? Probably not. Nice, right? I do. Google it. I do. So he, he goes outside and he dials 911. And his friend is having the most excruciating pain in his chest, clearly having a massive heart attack. And he drops dead 20 minutes later. Well, 20 minutes after that, 911 shows up and they look at him and he's dead. So he says, this Rev Herschel says, help, save my friend. And they said, well, he stopped breathing, you know, clearly many minutes ago. There's nothing we can do if it's in the first, you know, one, two, three, four minutes, maybe. But after that, he's gone. They put a sheet on him and he goes crazy. He said, never again. And he goes out and buys one oxygen tank. And he says, if it ever happens, at least I'll be able to do something. I won't feel helpless and hopeless. Wow. Well, He's probably sitting there for a month or two or three. I don't know the exact timeline. And he says, my favorite expression, I'm, I'm interjecting this, is give somebody fish and they have a meal for the night, but teach them how to fish and they have a meal forever. He says, what good is it going to be if I'm alone with my oxygen tank? What if I'm in Borough Park or what if I'm out of town or what if I'm helping somebody and somebody else needs help? So he starts an organization with Herschel Weber in 1969, 54 years ago, called Hevra Hatzalah the guys of Hatzala, the group. Yeah. And he goes out and he does a little fundraiser in Shul and he gets 20 of them, an oxygen tank. 20. 20. Wow. An oxygen tank and, a, and a, um, a first aid kit and maybe a stair chair or two just to help somebody, a patient down. And that's what Hatzala was. It was in Williamsburg. He had some ladies from the community answer the phones, put out a number, and they used to have a beeper system where if you dialed the number, there was no you know, read out, it just, if it beeped, you would then call the dispatcher and the dispatcher would say, head to 123 uh, Lee Avenue and off you went. And that was Hevra Hatzala. Wow. Well, that was 1969, 1970, the Lower East Side said, hey, if it's good on that side of the bridge, why don't we open up a Hatzala? And 1971, uh, so that was, I think, Hesh, Heshi Jacobs, Zechor Malavracha. And then in 1971, it was uh, Rebelable Bastritsky in Crown Heights. Crown Heights opened. And then it was Borough Park. And then it was Flatbush. And then in 1977, my dad starts Queens Atala. But here you have neighborhood after neighborhood. Now, if you fast forward to today, Hatzala is the most incredible boys club in the world, saving lives in almost every single Jewish community. Undisputed, right? yeah. Not only um, boys, I understand, of late. <laughs> yeah, but predominantly, right? <laughs> for the most part. So you're talking about South Africa and Australia. You're talking about Mexico City and Panama. You're talking about Antwerp and London and Switzerland and Manchester. And you're talking about, you know, places that not just that we think of, like Chicago and LA and, and Toronto, but the most remote places in the world when there's a Jewish community, Argentina, there's a Hatzala. How amazing is that? Now, I got to tell you something interesting, which people don't realize. And that is that Hatzala, it's not like uh, Staples, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, Ikea, 
where there's a, a corporate home office and there's just, you know, everyone's connected. We share a name, we share a mission, and but every single organization within the Hatsala, I'm gonna use it network or the name Hatsala, is unique. Now, yes, it started with Hebra Hatsala, and I'm very, very proud to be a member of Hebra Hatsala in Queens and in the Catskills in the summer, and they are the trademark name holder of it, but they've really blossomed from a tiny little idea in New York to show you what a global, you know, incredible organization. I love to say, and I think I heard this from Rav Pesach Kron, but I don't really remember exactly, that one day after 120, what's going to happen is Herschel Weber is going to go to Shemayim and they're going to say, make room, make room for Herschel Weber. And everybody's going to look like, who is this guy? Like, why are we making so much room for him? And somebody, one of the malachim is going to say, because there was a 38-year-old girl who had broke her back in Panama. And he's going to say, wrong guy. I was never in Panama. And they're going to say, yeah, you were never in Panama. But because you started Hatzala in 1969, and it spread to Borough Park and Flatbush and Queens and, and eventually Hatzala Air, you're getting a little chalik of every single life that's saved for the rest of mankind wow. because of your idea. Like kindness is contagious. It's like me the Kenega and Mida. That's what that's what really happened. And I'm, first of all, I really appreciate that brief like timeline of history of Atsala. Like it's it makes it and I think for, for me at least, but I think for many people my age, we think of Atsala and we're like, it's been around forever. Nineteen sixty nine is not that long ago. Like it's not been around forever. So you're saying I'm not that old. Yeah. <laughs> A little old. Hashem should be gazent. <laughs> he should. Like, should be and gazent. the fact that the person who started Hatzala is still alive, Baruch Hashem, he should live and be well. It's so fa- it's so fascinating. I heard a story about about Rav Weber. I don't know. If, I don't know the whole thing, so I don't know if I'm going to say it. But that he, w- w- after he started these efforts uh, and Hatzala, and he ran into someone's apartment to save them, and I don't, and I think unfortunately the person had passed away, and he was he was leaving, and someone on the streets saw it happen, and they made like a comment. They made like a comment, like you know, like we, this is why we need nine one one. You don't know what you're doing, and it, and it really, really hurt him. It hurt him deep, and it made him question, "What am I doing? Like, am I am I equipped for this? Am I starting this?" And um, he went to his rav, and 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 like this is the part where I don't know anymore. <laughs> you mean like the most important part? Of the the part? <laughs> no, but basically, the rav like told him like. You need to you need to keep going. You need to keep going. But it, it, to me, like it's a, it's a power of. Can you imagine he listened to that person? Wow. Can you imagine Herschel Weber listened to that person who said something like negative, like, ugh, like, like honestly, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. The people in Panama wouldn't be wouldn't be getting help. Everyone in this room right now, I'm sure, has had to, had to use the service of Atsala at some point, whether for good, welcoming a child into the world, or for bad. You know. Every single person listening to this podcast, I'm sure, either directly or indirectly, has been helped tremendously by Atsala. And can you imagine if Herschel Weber in that moment listened to that person who said something? But that that is exactly what I mean by the power of delivery, right? Yeah. We all make choices every day. We make choices to be a giver or make choices to be a taker, right? You're turning left or you're turning right in everything that we do. But most people look at an opportunity at, in a in a two-dimensional plateau and they say, here's my opportunity, I do it or I don't do it. But the expression, kolamakayim nefesh achaz ke'ilu, Kiam Ola Mali, right? If you save one life, it's as if you save the whole world. Well, look at this. The person, I don't know, maybe somebody saved Herschel Weber's life six months earlier, right? And now he created, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of lives saved because of the actions of one person. So I think, you know, I take it as a lesson every day. And I, I'm inspired and charged by Herschel Weber and by every single Hatzala member, wherever they are in the world, to be a giver. And I have to tell you something. You guys um, or you just mentioned that everybody has benefited from Hatzala. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to challenge that a little bit and say that even those who have never called Hatzala, just knowing yeah. that you have a Hatzala in our community, knowing that people will get out of their beds at two o'clock in the morning for anything or for nothing, right? You, listen, in certain communities, right? People overreact and certain times people underreact. You know, in one community I can think of, if a, life, if a light bulb, you know, explodes, somebody says, Hatsula, right? <laughs> and in Washington Heights, 
they'll call up, you know, when the husband's not feeling well and stops breathing and they'll say, my husband's not acting himself today, right? Mm-hmm. And you get there and it's in cardiac arrest. You say, no, he's a lift fuck, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, and every single, whether you're a chassid or whether you're, you know, a, a black yarmulke or no yarmulke, whether you're old or young, at the end of the day, we are blessed to have an army of volunteers that selflessly drops everything 24 hours a day with no vacation, Gaval. none. And really people could say the same thing about Atzala Air now because for that family that's vacationing in Panama or they're maybe in the Bahamas or they're in Florida and you know there could be that that fear of like well in the back of their mind like what if something happens here like we're let's say we're going to Panama or let's say we go to the Bahamas or or like well our doctors are not here and it could be the medical care that we need is not here well insert Atzala Air so you know, you asked me what the genesis of Hatzala Air is. Yeah. So I'd like to think of myself as a student of Herschel Weber and a student of my father and my, my brother and and the people that I have watched and witnessed. Um, so I have a pretty boring data company that I've been part of for 30 plus years, surrounded by, you know, many brilliant, capable people in our in our company. And we had a plane that we would use to to visit our clients around the country. We have a small number of clients, but they're pretty important, big shot type companies. And um, people would call me as an individual and they'll say, hey, Ellie, you know, I've been a commercial pilot for decades. And uh, they'd say, you're a pilot and you're a paramedic, but I need help. And I can think of, you know, uh, many such individual one-off type cases where I was the individual Hatzala guy who just happened to be a pilot, who just happened to have access to an aircraft. And I would fly Killer combo. Killer combo. Can we back up for a second? Like, what? How many Jewish pilots do you know? What what was, when, why did you become a pilot? So I, I I think I became a pilot because um, my father's brother was a pilot. And oh, yeah? I remember you loved aviation. I remember as a kid, and you know what? I still do it. I guess I'm. I guess I'm still a kid. Every single 14, time. Forty years of experience. That's a great line. Like, I'm title life. title of the episode: the fifty four year old yeah. child. The fifty. Well, yeah, somewhere between fourteen and, and I was eighteen. Like, uh, we could workshop that. <laughs> <laughs> but objection. Every single time an airplane or a helicopter passes overhead, I'm like, I mean, yeah. you, you know, it's not even ADD. I'm just glued. It's just a. Aviation. Oh, that was Momo cute. also, by the way, because the North Wimmer, they're practically landing on his house. <laughs> <laughs> they're flying. They're right over the flight the path. North right? Park, by the way, it's like every twelve you can, seconds. You can see what they're eating in the plane. It's wild. <laughs> but but I can't get enough of that. And and um, now people ask me all the time, like you know, how long is it to become a pilot? That's like saying yeah. you know, how long is it to become a Talmud Chacham? Right? You can you can read Hebrew and and then you can learn Gemara and then you can teach Gemara or you can know Shas. Right? There's Lahavdil, so many different versions of being a pilot. And um, today, um, what's called a type rated, you know, commercial jet pilot, where uh, we can talk about that a little bit later, but- um, Or right now. Yeah. Okay, fine, let's, start, <laughs> talk, let's just talk about it right now. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful Build podcast. You know, I'm in my basement right now recording in this little home studio, but I wish I was outside on my swing set because swing it, it's such an amazing job putting together this swing set for me, my playscape, my kids love it. My wife loves it. My family loves it. My friends love it. They all come by and say, Hey, listen, I'm sorry, but we're going to be here a lot using this swing set. It is also just the best quality. You know, sometimes I, uh, I'm, I'm driving and I see these swing sets that, okay, okay. Those, those kids are getting splinters for days and that swing set probably has a year or two left in them. Well, it doesn't happen for a swing set from swing it, you know, because They are built to last. Their structures are made with solid hardwood beams, which are then wrapped in fade-proof, weatherproof PVC so the wood won't rot and it won't give those kids splinters. And it includes a 20-year full-service warranty. You know, I I know that by heart, by the way, guys. I sleep with that. I go, PVC, hardwood. It's amazing. Um, Besides the fact that it gives and adds an element to this outdoor playing space for your backyard, your side yard, wherever it is. Let me tell you something. If you reach out to them today, you can still maybe get something by your house before Shoshana. So you can hit them up at swingit.com or hit the link in the description as shown into this episode. Message them directly on WhatsApp and see what they can put together for you. Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Yantav is coming up. Maybe you have guests and maybe you want a swing set from Swingit in your yard. So go ahead and reach out to Swingit today. Now back to this episode. If you're a 747 pilot for 20 years, 
and you want to fly a 777 or a 787, another plane, you have the license and you're a commercial pilot or an air, you know, an ATP, an airline transport pilot. But at the end of the day, you cannot transition to a plane without going to school for it. So you go to something called flight safety, which is the biggest one. It's a Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger company. And, um, Oh, that's a good story I should tell you on the side about Charlie Munger. I'll tell you a little bit later. Yeah. Thank you for giving Charlie the shout out, by the way, because Warren gets I don't all know the who, glory. I don't know who Charlie is. I know Warren. Charlie's one of Warren's original, original partners. Is lives down the street from my parents, by the way. Is that right? Yes. Is that in LA? In Los Angeles, yeah. Los Angeles. How are you over there? Early? We get his mail sometimes because the, the numbers get transposed. I hope you get his bank uh, <laughs> <laughs> mail. What? He actually, it's a funny story if we're going to transgress. Transgress? Digress. Digress. If we're transgressing. Let's not transgress. Oh, okay. digress it is LL. It is LL. <laughs> we don't want to well, transgress. We need, so, we need something to, uh, to, to, to do. <laughs> we're in the middle for. of a second parenthesis right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're in brackets. Yeah. So I get a phone call. Um, I was driving home from the airport from a flight. And um, it was fascinating. A guy calls me on FaceTime. And um, I think it's a little socially off to call somebody for the first time. For the time. first time on FaceTime. It's a little forward. It's a little direct. But I'm just driving, you know, in the rain at night and this guy calls me on FaceTime and I'm not really paying attention. And he goes, is this Eli? And I said, yes. He goes, my name's Munga, Charles Munga. <laughs> you know, did you know who that was? You know, I, th I thought I did and I think I did, but I didn't really. And, and somebody, a friend of mine, Avi Hager, I don't know if you know who sure. he is. LA. LA. Yeah. So, so he had mentioned his name, but I totally forgot. And he says... I hear you run an organization called Hezbollah Air. <laughs> and I said, well, close. <laughs> it's called Hatzalah, and it comes from the Hebrew word, you know, Hatzalah, La Hatzil. And I tell him, I give him a little bit of an overview, you know, 30 seconds, and I go, how can I help you? He says, well, I run a small organization called NetJets, and I have another company called Flight Safety. And he said, I'm so impressed with what you do. I want to be able to bring you into our buying power wow. and be able to offer you, you know, discounts and things that we have that we can get. And unsolicited. Un un well, I think it was a it was directed by Avi Hager, who, okay. who's just you know an unbelievable chesed machine. But yeah. um, but wow. uh, that's incredible. It, it was it was just a wonderful way to to create a a win win partnership that you know didn't cost him, but totally gained and made him you know feel. Uh, um, doing a chesed, right? It's like he just did his act of kindness for that day by uh, by, by bringing Hatzalah on. It's kind of erroneous that he was trying to reach Hezbollah air, though. I'm kind of nervous about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, especially since we spoke about September 11th. Yeah. Right? yeah. But no, he it, it was it was unbelievably generous of him, and, and he connected us with, you know, super important people who have been uh, um, really extended, you know, amazing opportunities for Hatzalah air through their buying power network. So are you able to fly all planes? You said you're a type rated pilot. So I happen to be type rated today in about five air, five big, um, mm -hmm. what, what they call corporate jets, mm -hmm. but we only keep active in two. Most pilots, they will eat either one or two pilots at one time, so your muscle memory goes. But what happens is you have to go the first, you go for about a month, depending on the aircraft. It could be 22, 23 days, it could be 35 days, but you go for about a month and you move into a university setting with crazy, crazy cool simulators. Mm. When you're sitting in it, you cannot tell that you're not looking out the window of a regular plane. And what they do is they'll say, okay, today we're flying from LaGuardia to Van Nuys, California. And you have the approaches and they go, we're going to fly at 930 at night. Wind is going to be coming out of the north, northeast at 35 miles an hour with blowing snow. And they simulate all those conditions. And then you look out the window and you recognize LaGuardia. Like, oh, I, there's, you know, there's a, is it Chase Stadium? Is that what it called? Yeah, maybe in 1969. Like, <laughs> <laughs> City Field. City Field. All right, there you go. I you should live, know that. Bro, you live in Queens. I live in Queens. I should know that. But I still Nahi's think of it. waiting for the. <laughs> that's it. I, I go, there's Mop my house. that over the plate for you, Nahi. But, yeah, but you, can, you. you can literally sit in a plane and it's called a full motion simulator. And they simulate every single possible thing that could go wrong getting, you know, striking a, a, um, a flock of birds on departure, right? And you can simulate the, the Sully um, miracle yeah. that he did. And you go through wind shear and turbulence and engine out and fires on board and rapid depressurization, et cetera. And that's what we train. So you, you do that for about a month per aircraft type. And then every six months you go for a week 
to what's called recurrent training. So um, I do that. And uh, actually the largest um, university system for pilots is called Flight Safety. And Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they own Flight Safety and um, they've offered Hatsala because we're a 501c3 and we're our own Sadako organization. They've offered us discounted rates at uh, Flight Safety. So, so, so nice. um, it's, it's, it's part of it. And I think that people around the world don't realize that while we share a name and while we share a mission, every single Hatsala organization in the world, even those within New York City, right now we're in Rockaway Lawrence. And so it's got its own Hatsala organization. Yes, it's part of the New York City Hebra Hatsala division of, or, or branch, or call it what you want to call it, but there's no direct connect between, say, Chicago and, you know, Queens between Panama and London, between South Africa and Belgium, right? We all share a name, we share a mission. In Israel, there's 20 plus individual independent Hatzalah organizations. In Europe, there's probably, I don't know how many, you know, uh, uh, in America, we've got dozens of yeah. Hatzalahs. There's just a new one or a few new ones that are opening now. So I actually saw on the news that Cleveland's now opening up a, a Hatzalah. Yeah, so the Ichiel Kelish went down to Cleveland to like uh, take care of that. Exactly. Well, Rabbi Kelish is amazing. He's just an amazing. He's the uh, he's the CEO yes, of Chevra Hatzalah, so. and he's a dynamic, impressive, super capable leader. And um, I I enjoy every moment I I, yeah. I sit with him. You should have him on the show. We oh, did. We did. Oh, oh, you did already. We did. He was All one right. of the first interviews that I've ever conducted. Actually. Oh, you should listen to the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I I really wish I I I, I want I want to find the time to listen to your show. You think we can get it like on the planes? Like yeah, maybe we can stream it. You know, behind the seat, behind the maybe. seats, and, and 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 put it on. Or better that you focus on what's yeah. You oh, you meant me. for you meant for the pilots, or you or yeah. you you know people people actually think that it's funny. People think that pilots are busy all the time. We're very busy in the climb out and we're very busy on approach, which, but the rest of the time, you know, we're, we're, we're watching. I mean, I'm, don't, don't, I don't want no, like, no, my mother to know this. Pilot. I don't want my mother to know this, but I'm watching, you know, like Dafyomi videos the rest of the time. Wow. You know, don't, and, and, and anything else that we need it's to It's so do. funny. I, um, I love Shout it. out to Rabbi Stefanski. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, we had oh, the head of also. Yeah. All right, I he, he, I did not have the privilege of. Yeah, Ali, this isn't our first episode of the podcast. Ever. <laughs> you know, here um, I was thinking I'm number. You yeah. know, I'm. I happen to be like a big aviation geek. Like, Is that I right? I used to have for sure. Remember this? I used to have on my computer like Flight Simulator X. Oh, sure. And I used to just like fly and and like. For, Today we're gonna go to Tennessee. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you something really funny. When at the end of your your training, the last day, they'll usually say, "Is there anything you want to do?" Right. So I'm, I'm like the guy that takes off from LaGuardia and say, hit me with as many, you know, birds as you can and flame out both my engines. Right. <laughs> and they're like, nobody ever asked that before. Right. But Hilton Head, South Carolina. Okay. We land there again in the simulator and it's a full motion sim. There's absolutely no difference between the real world and that you're feeling, you know, as you turn, you feel everything on the runway. You should, guys should look this up. There are two Kvarim built into the runway have what? you ever heard this before no oh. we're gonna so, fact uh, check it though yeah you, go ahead you should fact check it hilton head south carolina airport has a grave two graves actually built into the the runway and what ended up happening was there was this cemetery and i think in the 1880s and the government built an airport there but there were two tombstones right there so instead of moving it they decided to actually put the names of the people on the runway as you as you uh you wow. know taxi down or you take off on approach i wonder if a cohen is allowed to fly out of hilton head south what carolina what are the names? you know the names i don't you, you guys you, you guys can look it up <laughs> but but i had heard about this and i said hey let's go fly to hilton head south carolina so i actually land and when i'm landing we went pretty slowly and we looked did I make yes, that up? Says, Confirmed says, in real time. The families, they wish for the graves to remain in place when western extension of this east to west runway was required during World War II. The graves of Richard and Catherine Dotson, along with two beloved relatives, Daniel Houston and John Dotson, remain undisturbed in and next to the airport's most active runway. Is May that rest in peace? Is that crazy? That's so so I, actually, I actually saw that during my training. Wow. And, and you, you can listen. You, yeah. you can go and watch that. So, so, uh, so from my understanding... Um, you're a pilot and you're a Hatzalah member and you're 
and people are like, hey, Ellie, you know, I'm stuck in this place. Do you mind coming and, you know, so you're like, you know, pairing the two and two together. At some point, I imagine you're like, this can actually be a full-blown organization. So the the answer is yes. You know, from, I would say probably from about 2015 and on, 2016, I started saying, hey, what Hatsala is, is really a bunch of guys. You need two qualifications, right? You need a bris and you need ADD. And you got a bunch of guys all around the world and they just love to drop everything to help. Yeah. Now, everybody's got chaverim. They're super impressive. Shomrim. I mean, today we've got chesed organizations at every single level. You need to borrow a cufflinks. I'm, there's a cufflink gamach, you know. It's, <laughs> it's just, we're... With everybody complaining about, you know, all the things that are wrong in our society, come on. We've yeah. never, ever, ever had the the magnitude and the impressive nature of chesed organizations. And Mikam Chisrael. Mikam Chisrael is so right. I am proud. I am actually proud when I see, you know, somebody stopped on the side of the road. We do it instinctively. Every single time there's somebody that breaks down, I just pull over. I don't think I'm yeah, doing Yeah, I don't it. even know. By the way, I don't know how to change a tire, and I pull over. You pull over anyway. Does he help? You're good? Okay, good. Because <laughs> I was going to change that tire. But I got to tell you something. <laughs> anything that they would want to do, anything that they would want, right? I, I take out money from my pocket and give strangers all the time. I would give them a ride. I would give them my bedroom if they needed to stay there. You just, that's what we do for each other, right? Yeah. And, and yet, you know, with with the with the uh, the way they say I don't, I don't remember how it's said in Hebrew but you know the generations get weaker and weaker when Scott it comes to, when it comes to Chesed I think we're crushing it we're yeah. just doing you know an incredible work so um, it came to it in about uh, 2017 or 18 I call up Chavra Hatzala and I go I'd like to start a new Hatzala division now every single Hatzala has a little let's call it a stake in the ground, right? So Cleveland's got Cleveland and they respect their boundaries. And Manchester, England or Gateshead or, or Antwerp, they've got their little stake in the ground. I said, I'd like to start a new one. And I'm sitting there with a boardroom of the whole, you know, executive leadership of Hatzala. And they're like, okay, what's Ellie Rowe gonna tell us today? And I said, I'd like to start an organization called Hatzala Air. And they huddle, they shuffle, they this, that, the other, they get back to us and they say, we'll get back to you. And then the next day they go, okay, no problem. You could do it. Now, they'll tell you today, they knew that there was no chance it was going to happen. So rather than argue and, and just push back. That was the cousin. Yeah, they said, just say yes. It wasn't going to happen anyway, right? And um, I sat with Ron Levy and Avishai Newman, a couple of incredible guys. Ron's a lawyer, Avishai is a doctor, and I'm telling them my vision. Avishai, how you know, are Avishai, you? Avishai, Anesthesiologist. Avishai is, I live in North Woodner. Avishai is just, he's He's Fire. just so unbelievable. We've been best, best, best friends for as long as I can remember. Um, we work together in, in, in many ways, and he's been an Atzala. We just, we go back forever. So I'm with them, and we say, okay, we're going to do it. But we figure, how is this possible that it's going to happen, that we're going to be able to pull this off? And I remember we put together, you know, a, a list of of names of people that we could call to maybe try to put together a few million dollars to get our first plane and and just get some money together and i meet a guy uh, i'm gonna say his name on uh, uh, uh publicly um ben phillipson yeah and you know him from i from, in his backyard he has is a that right his, he has a yeah. shawl and i tell him and he goes and i, and I was like hinting that you know tasha chassid tasha chassid and i'm hinting and i had actually flown uh, a couple of years back, I had flown when the Tasha Rebbe was was uh, sick on a Matzah Shabbos. I flew some doctors there again, as yeah. as you know, the the individual, not as uh, the organization, to Tush. And um, and then I'm like, well, you know, I I, I just didn't even have I I don't have the ability to actually ask I need anybody a plane, for money. <laughs> no, he, I didn't say anything about a plane. We wanted to collect from like twenty people, one hundred and eighty thousand yeah. dollars to be able to get. And I'm and I go. What's going on? He goes, all right, I'll do the first plane. And it, that's how Atzala Air started. No way. Now, in September of 2019. In okay, Eugene fashion. Eugene fashion. Yeah. Yes, in Eugene fashion. And he is going to go into Shemayim. He's, he's going to, after, you know, 180. And they're going to open the gates of Shemayim. Shari Shemayim Pesach. It's, I like that song, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and 
And um, and they're going to put him in and they're going to say, you get a seat next to the Kisiak covered because of the fact that this person in Argentina was saved and this person in, in, in Panama and Mexico and, and London and Israel because of you. And he really started an unbelievable organization without even realizing. And I don't wow. believe that at the time he realized what he was doing, but he's been he's been beautiful to Hatala Air and and it's it's just amazing. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. For the last time, I want to tell you something very, very important. This organization that I'm about to mention is really fascinating. It is called Aim Higher. So what is Aim Higher? Aim Higher is a nonprofit job placement organization that exclusively works with individuals age 40 plus that are struggling to find employment. So, you know, the job market is extremely competitive and sadly many people over the age of 40 struggle to find employment due to their age which isn't right. Aim Hire specifically targets seekers ages 40 plus who have been unemployed or underemployed for at least 18 weeks and are qualified seasoned professionals experiencing financial challenges. Unlike any other organization that exists, Aim Hire offers to subsidize 100% of job seeker salary for the first month of employment to ensure their confidence that you'll be satisfied with their candidates if you just give them a chance. Like if you're a company, you work with Aim Hire, they have someone who's age 40 plus, who has experience, who's good for the job, and they will pay for their salary for the first month, 100% of the salary. So you give them a chance. That is unbelievable. I've never heard of that before. That is a game changer. If you're looking to hire and age isn't a factor, please reach out to Aim Hire by applying on the website at www.aim-hire.org, or you can email them at info at aim-hire.org. Lastly, you can contact them at 917-246-0621 for further information. Lastly, if you have been struggling with unemployment and you meet the aim higher criteria, you can apply now and they will try to help you as best as they can. You can head to their website or send them an email. A big, big shout out to all the work aim higher is doing. It is a true chesed. So a big thank you to them. And now back to Ellie Rowe. I want to open a parenthesis for a moment. I noticed a few times in this conversation, you have a very spiritual perspective. Your view on things, you see things in terms of people accessing the Kisaya covered and I'm wondering what that what that foundation excuse me looks like where does that come from you know I've seen people in all cycles of life and I've been at way more um, uh, people's patira than possible and I realized that our time on this world is really fleeting and we're not here just to take from the world, which is what most people, you know, since we're babies, we're, we're designed to take, right? But I really believe that every single one of us is a leader in Klal Yisrael, and every one of us has the ability to give and give and give. But, you know, most people really believe that when you give, you, you just lose what you have, right? When you give, you're giving up, you know, the word. Giving is giving up. I really believe that every single person, every single time they give, they're getting so much more than the person that's uh, that's taking it. And um, well, we probably don't have time for my favorite Vatoro. If we do at the end, mm. I'll, I'll say something over for my dad. But you know, by definition, um, it's just a bracha. We're so lucky. I feel bad. I actually have rahmana on people that don't give to Dhaka and, and don't do it. Well, anyway, coming back. I want to invite you to give covet to your father continue the theme of giving and share his Dvar Torah. I'm going to share his. It's my favorite Dvar Torah and I'm going to say it quickly, but yeah, I'd love to give cover to my father. On the, you know, Bnei Yisrael were um, commanded to each, you know, to count Bnei Yisrael by giving a half a shekel. And Moshe says, Moshe Rabbeinu, I don't know what a half a shekel is. So Rashi says, Hashem showed him, Heralo kamin matbeah shel esh. He, sh- he shows him a matbea coin of fire. Now, the counting of Bnei Yisrael, what is the the children of Israel? What are we always compared to? Three things, right? What are the three things? I'm going to put you guys on the spot. What, <laughs> what are the three things? Bnei Yisrael should be fruitful and multiply like the? Sand, sand stars. stars. Okay. Sand, stars, and, and dust, right? Like oh, the yeah. dust of the earth, like the sand. Those you skittles. guys got them, like the sand and like the stars. So if this was an exercise in counting Klal Yisrael, my father asks, why on earth did Hashem not say to Moshe Rabbeinu, look up and see 50 stars and make a matbea, a coin of 50 stars? Or even easier, where was he? He was probably in the midbar in the desert, right? Why didn't he just, Hashem say to him, look down and see 2,000 specks of, of dust or 2,000 kernels of, 
of sand. You like the question? Love it. Now, there's a hundred explanations that fire because it lights up a room, it puts out the darkness, it, it's yeshivasha answers, right? But he says the following. 70 lane highway. How Shiva many, st- exactly. How many stars are there in the galaxy? I'm asking you guys, how many stars? Most people don't put you on the spot like I do, right? <laughs> how many stars? Infinity, no. Let's not. agree that that's a bad answer. Let's agree that what it's the, a- What I said's a bad answer? Yeah. Okay. Is that all right? Am I allowed to say that well, on the show? Well, it can't be infinity. No, you just bring me a, back to my seventh there's grade There's a trauma. definite amount of stars. It's an unknown amount. I'm going to agree that that's an excellent infinite. answer. You get, you, you get two points for that well, or eight points. So let's agree that it's a seemingly finite- Pick me, by the way. You go on. Seemingly, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, make up for, I'll make up for it. It's a seemingly finite, yet finite number of stars in the galaxy. Can we agree with that? Yeah. In mathematical terminology, we'll call that X. There is a number. We just don't know what it is. X stars in the galaxy. Sand, dust. Same. There's a finite number of particles of, of sand or, or little kernels of sand. We don't know what it is, but X. Now, if Hashem would have taken 50 stars out to make a matbea, a coin of stars, how many stars would be left in the galaxy x minus 50 whatever that number is minus 50 same with the sand x minus 2000 particles to make a coin of sand or of dust my father explains the following hashem had to use fire when it came to this where did this money go from the this 300,000 shekel that they collected it went to the mishkan it was the first form of public tzedakah that jews were exposed to now watch what happens you have $10 in your pocket. You have $100 in your pocket. Let's make it a nice example. You have 100 bucks, and a guy says to you, hey, Nachi, I need some money. You take out 10. Now, what would conventional wisdom dictate? If you have 100 minus 10, you're left with 90. Says my dad, Aish, fire, is the only property that you can take something away from it. And not only did you not reduce the care and reduce that $100, but you've actually created something new and now the other person has it. That is the power, in my opinion, of chesed. It's the power of tzedakah. You think that you're giving, but in actuality, when you wake up in the morning and you get to give somebody a dollar or a smile or walk them across the street or stop like you do, whether you, even if you didn't give them a ride or fix their flat, when they see you stopping, I promise you, there's a comfort, there's a sense of absolute delicious warmth that Nachi Gordon stopped and, and said, are you okay? Can I do something for you? Gevald. And it might just... Gevald. Gevald. It's what Gevald. it is. It's an amazing, it's an amazing Torah. If I may yeah. share with you, I hope there's time for this, that the Torah is referred to as a lekach toiv. Ki lekach toiv nasati lochem. It's a good transaction. And Chazal explained what makes it a good transaction is that typically when two parties transact, in order for one to sell or give something away, it requires that loss that you're talking about. But the Torah is unique in that one can share a piece of Torah with someone else and still maintain what they've given away. So that's what makes it a unique and good transaction. Oh, love that. Because you can give away without a loss. And the question is, isn't this true of any chachma, of any wisdom? I can teach someone mathematics and retain my knowledge. So why is the Torah specifically? The Torah is a chachma. It's a wisdom, but it's much more than that. So why is the Torah uniquely kilek achtayv? And I heard once beautifully that... A ch- uh, the Chachma, one's wisdom, is not a part of the essence of the person. The, the Pesach in Yirmiya says, Al yisal al chacham b'chachmasay. A person should not feel haughty about their Chachma because it doesn't. it's not a part of them. The same way al yisal al asher ba'ashray. One's possessions is not a part of the person. And al yisal al gibar b'gvurasay. A person's strength is not a part of their essence. Similarly, on a, more, on a higher level, even a person's wisdom is not a part of the essence of the person. And we see sometimes people towards the end of their life, the the essence of the person is not always indicative of their wisdom. Sometimes that diminishes. But Torah becomes a part of the human being, a part of the essence of that person's soul. That fire of the Torah is that human being's essence. Love that. And they can give that away without a loss. That a person can give it away, that's that's like a Amazing. So we Sorry, got I'm it. going on a rant here. We got it. It's, good. it's good. excellent. The way to part, the Gemara says, the way to part from from someone is with a with a piece of Torah. Right? Give person give a person a piece of Torah. So is that it? Our our our, <laughs> no, our talks over? No, not yet. Should we take kach because by doing so they will remember you. 
So is it just a reference? Oh, Ellie Rowe told me that, Tyra. So I'll remember, I'll remember you for that. So give the person a Diet Coke. You'll sooner come across that piece of, of Tyra. But if you're giving them a piece of you and you're taking a part of your essence and you're, and you're sharing that, now the person has a piece of you with which to remember you. It's not a reference. You're giving them a piece of your neshama. You're giving them a piece of your essence. With that, they'll remember you. That's amazing. Beautiful. That's incredible. I'm happy I came for that. Yeah. Let me ask you, in terms of just, you know, operational, I'm sure that Hatzalah Air gets a lot of phone calls and emails of flight requests. Someone could be somewhere in the world and they say, hey, can Hatzalah Air come, come pick us up? It, well, I mean, do you guys take every single call and go for it? What's, what's that like? You know, it's funny how you zeroed in on that when we talked about our first operational conversation about Hatzalah Air. So first of all, Let's go back to 2019. Our first flight was in September of 2019. People today, in the beginning, nobody ever heard of Hatzalah Air. Yeah. I mean, we hardly heard of Hatzalah Air. We were just making it up and, and just you know going with the flow when we started. But we started with one plane. Our first mission was in September of 2019, and we were getting about one flight request every three weeks. Today, we have nine aircraft, and we get about 30 flight requests a week. Wow. So what your point is, is that how do we do it? That's actually our biggest challenge. Your question is our biggest challenge. People think, oh, it's getting aircraft. You know, today we, all the helicopter EMS in the state of Israel, we have four helicopters, two are in service and two more are coming into service now. And um, our ability to be able to um, service people is different in Israel than in the rest of the world. In Israel, we service everyone. It's a cooperative agreement that we have multi-year with Magin David Adom staffs, the uh, helicopters in Israel, and we respond to any emergency. It could be a drowning, it could be a terror attack, anything that needs helicopter transport for, imagine a somebody falls off Masada, right? They're nowhere yeah. near a hospital. If they're a soldier, then they typically get, you know, um, transported with a helicopter that's from the Air Force or from what's called Unit 669. It's like the Coast Guard equivalent in Israel. But anything else, somebody's having a heart attack or, or a terror attack or literally a, a drowning that's far away, the Hatzalah Air, Magen David Adom helicopters will transport the people. But then we have over here in America four aircraft one um, which is the first one that Ben gave, the Lear 60, which is soon, soon to be retiring. Two Citation 10s. They're the fastest planes in the world. I think I was on the Citation 10. I was by your hangar in, in, in near Westchester. Westchester, yep. So I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful plane. Beautiful. And, and you it's, say it's the fastest plane in the world? It's unique. It's the fastest plane outside of military jets. So the speed of an aircraft is typically governed by Mach, which is the speed of sound, right? How quickly the sound is going from me to you. And that plane flies at 0.92, so more than nine-tenths the speed of sound. It is the fastest plane in the world outside of military jets. Wow. And we thought it was the perfect, it's a, called a super midsize aircraft. It's not as big as a Gulfstream and it's not as small as a little, you know, some of the smaller jets. But what's amazing is we've got two seats for the pilot and the co-pilot. You need two pilots on it. We've got eight seats and the eight seats, every two of them we can replace with a stretcher. So we could have one or two stretchers. If we have one stretcher, we're left with six seats, typically two or three uh, medical crew and then up to two or three family members. This morning, as Shia told us who just walked in, we had a baby, uh, an infant on a ventilator with a very, very specialized team with a neonatologist and a, a respiratory therapist and flight medic, and, and we were able to take the two parents along. And it was unbelievable that we were able to you know, do this mission with these uh, Citation 10 aircraft. And we have a, a large aircraft called a Gulfstream, a G550 that's able to fly from New York or Miami nonstop to Israel. And um, it's been superb. Somebody gave it to us, to Hatzalah. Every plane is donated. And um, now we're opening up in Mexico, a Mexico City Hatzalah. So that's our uh, what, fifth plane in the North wow. America region. And it's continuing to grow. We're going to put a plane in Israel. We're putting a plane in Europe, um, likely next year. We're still uh, working with the European team. But with the 30 or so requests that we get a week, it's really challenging. 
because every single person who calls only sees their emergency. We like to say emergencies of one or emergencies of any or emergencies of many. To the recipient, to the person that's crushed in September 11th, he doesn't really care whether 3,000 other people are crushed, right? It's the emergency for that individual. And when we get called, we have a tough time because for that person who's calling hot solar air, I stub my toe in Argentina, my toe's really hurting, right? And we just say, I'm really sorry, we're, you know, we're not taking you back. So what's that process? Like, how do you decide what, what qualifies? Yeah. So we, we really have, everything falls into three buckets. We have the incredibly urgent, like transplants, et cetera. Yesterday, was it yesterday or two days ago? I lose track. Um, we took a young lady. We flew her to St. Louis for a heart. I mean, her heart was almost, you know, at the end of life. And doctor said, this is her last shot at life. And there's a heart or she needs to go into St. Louis. And we sent an unbelievable team for free. Every flight we do is for free on the emergency flights. And boom, off we go. That's it. And we took her to St. Louis. There's a specialized center over there that puts hearts in people. This was a young from lady who wow. needed a heart. We don't hear that. Right. You know, on Pesach, we had a, uh, a 12 year old that was in one of the islands who had a stroke. I ne- I'm a paramedic for 30 plus years. I never heard of a 12 year old that had a stroke. Okay. Those are the types of flights that we just pick up and go. go. A broken back, the types of things where loss of life, loss of limb, loss of function, et cetera, it's a guaranteed yes. So that's probably our top, you know, under 20%, let's say 10 to 20%. It's a no brainer yes. Then we have the no brainer no's. Now to us, it's a no brainer, but to the caller, it's not. My parents are celebrating their 50th anniversary and the doctor doesn't want them flying commercial. And this is really gonna make their life if we send them to the Bahamas. Can you send a team with them in the Bahamas and, and be with them for a week, right? Now, maybe I would go, right? <laughs> but it's just a guaranteed no. We say no. And then you have that 50, 60% of Does calls. Does no come with an invitation for some self-awareness? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe a link yeah. to Delta? <laughs> yeah, right. Have you ever heard of American Airlines? <laughs> right. But they don't want to do that. Yeah. They don't want to fly commercial for any reason or for no reason. But they're like, what do you mean? Uh, we gave $18 to Hatsala Air in the last <laughs> campaign. To, yeah. to, no, not even Hatsala Air. To Hatsala yeah. in, uh, you know, in wherever. And boom, they, they want to go and, uh, and, and use our services. And, and we just very, very politely say no. Now we have a form that you know, we send them and they fill out. And we've got the most incredible case managers. I once, you know, I, someone reached out to me because they needed to use Hatsala Air Services. Is that right? Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I remember speaking to one of the ladies at your office. I don't know who it was, but she, I remember she sent me the form. I passed on to fo- the form to this person. I don't, I, don't, I don't recall. I don't remember. I didn't follow up if they ended up. But I, I do re- I do remember the process of getting the form, sending them a form, filling it out, and, and sending it. You would mentioned that third bucket is like the 50%, 60%. Like what's, what are so, those? So, so that's our not guaranteed yeses and not guaranteed noes. And what we do is under Dr. Newman and Dr. Grushko, guy Mike Grushko, he's the chief of electrophysiology at, at Einstein. And I, I think Jacoby, he's a cardiologist. He's a volunteer. He goes on flights. And these guys, them, and, and we have pediatricians and different doctors and different specialties, they have a chat. And we say, who wants to take the next flight request? And these case managers, you say in the office, we don't have an office. Everybody works from home. Yeah. Wow. We don't have overhead. We don't have paid employees. Everyone is a volunteer in Hot Cellar Air. We've got one guy who looks after the facilities who's paid. And the rest, it's just the pilots and the maintenance who we don't want any favors. Yeah. We want to pay them and we want to pay them higher than normal salaries because we want the best of the best to be able to go and uh, and go through school well and, and be disciplined and be ahead of the curve and everything that we do when it comes to aviation. But the case managers, the dispatchers, the people that the, the doctors and the medics and the respiratory therapists and the, the people that, you know, order equipment and, and all that. That's all volunteers. You want to talk about Mika Amcha Yisrael? It's unbelievable. When you go on a hot cell call, it's an hour. Today, Shia Farkas and his friends who are volunteers and the neonatologist, the doctor and the respiratory therapist who gave up that day, 
They met in Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan this morning at about 5 or 5.30, and they just came back now at 5 or 5.30. You're talking about 12 hours, and they do it with a smile. Wow. So that middle group, which represents the overwhelming majority of cases, has a flight review by a physician or a request review by a physician. Usually a board member or two physicians will come on. Dr. Newman and Dr. Dr. Grushko will oversee that process. And we set a chat and we go back and forth and we deliberate and we we really, really, really look out for every single flight request. But oftentimes we do come up with alternates. You know, you guys made a joke of Delta and American Airlines. We will offer somebody to go and fly with them on a commercial airline. We had a young guy. I mean, you'll offer them to be accompanied by a paramedic. Yeah, yeah. We had somebody who was just discharged, a young guy in his 30s, had a stroke, needed to go to the West Coast, and he was discharged to home. And they said, we need hot cellar air. And we said, why? And they said, because we're afraid something's going to happen to him. Who would look after him? Who's going to take his vital signs? So we said, we'll be happy to do it. And one of our flight paramedics, a guy by the name of Howie Sickles, he escorted this fellow and went there and then took the overnight flight and came back at five o'clock the next morning. And that's what we do day in and day out to be able to go and, um, and help people. The other thing that we do pretty effectively is that when we're going to a place typically, and people don't realize this at all, and I bet you didn't even think about this. When we do a flight, we do a flight request, it's usually three flights, right? There, there. Well, that's two. Depending on where the patient's going. It, exactly, so if you, if you go on a hot solo call, right, from your house and you live in North Woodmere, and you go pick up a patient on, on Peninsula and Rockaway Boulevard, so you've gone from your house to Peninsula, from there, you go to Long Island Jewish Hospital. That's leg two, and then you drive home is leg so you're three. You're saying you might you might go pick up someone in Cincinnati, go to Cleveland, and then go back, back to New York. Bingo. So that morning, I think that we met Shabbos. I think you went from Willow to Lakewood to Ohio, back to Willow. Yes, we had, we had a rub. all before Kiddush. We, we we had a rub as long as I made it back for Kiddush. That's <laughs> that's that's my you How know. How many and have you kept? <laughs> So, you know, I actually think I'm a Kaddish to Shabbos. I think I keep, I keep every Shabbos and, and, and doing chesed, really, yeah. it, it's not a chil Shabbos in sure, any yeah. way, shape, or form. I'll tell you something. The funniest things that happen to me are when I go, let's say, on an overnight Friday night, right? And then when we come back at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, there's an emergency and we have to go fly and pick up somebody like, you know, that Rav from Lakewood and fly him to Cleveland, Right. And then we'll come back and let's say we land at 8.30 or 9 o'clock and I drive home and I throw on a suit and I walk into shul at 10.15. Invariably, somebody's going to say, Ro, sleeping late again, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'll just go like, you know, it is what it is. I, you know, some of us like to sleep on Friday night. Yeah. And, um, but yeah. I remember I was with you by the I go to convention and I said like, oh yeah, maybe we'll talk. Mar of time, you're like, you're like, I don't think I'm going to be here by tomorrow. I think I'm going to Cincinnati. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to the tea room. <laughs> Enjoy. I, yeah. And I actually flew out during, during, yeah. the, during the, I got a convention. You know, it's funny when I think, um, when I think back to some of the crazier flights I had, one of them was, uh, was with Rabbi Wallerstein, Zachron Levracha, Zacharia. He was a, he was a really dear friend of mine. I, I met him through, his daughter had a, a car accident and, uh, we just met, I like to say we met by accident, yeah. but, um, but one time I was taking off in Sullivan County and um, the way it works is you take off the ground, right? And you're, it's called the landing gear. The wheels are down. And in order to be able to get the maximum lift, you, you don't want any dirty airplane, right? Dirty is anything that sticks out. So your flaps come up and your landing gear comes up to make it nice and smooth for the, for the, uh, to get the maximum takeoff. And a landing gear doesn't retract. And I'm thinking, this is weird. So we try to cycle the gear. It means you put it down and then lift it up. And I'm with Rabbi Wallerstein and we're on some mission that I can't talk about on a, you know, on, on, on a, on a public setting, but he had a, an extreme chesed that, that uh, he was running at the time. And um, we just couldn't get it up. So we divert and we go to a service center. This is at night. And they told us that we had hit an animal on the takeoff roll and it actually bent the door which didn't permit us wow. from uh from you know putting the, the wheels into the airplane 
And um, the next day we called the airport to say, was there anything on the runway? And they're like, there was a dead fox on the runway that we had obviously hit on wow. takeoff. Right, so um, Baruch Hashem, I got to tell you something. You you maybe noticed it. Did you notice that it very proudly says Basiata the Shmaya? Yes, there is a base Amokhtalat on the plane. It That's does. not a joke. And people say, it's pretty cool. <laughs> what? Is that a joke? I say, let me tell you something. It ain't BDS, it's BSD. <laughs> That's right. And the BSD, and, and we say very, very, very proudly, and I point it out, you know, wherever we go, to Jews and non-Jews alike, that it stands for with God's help, with Hashem's help. And I learned this from my father in Queens, Atzala. On one side, it would say, Be'ezra Hashem, and on the other side, it would say, Be'siyata Deshmaya. So a guy said to my father once, let me ask you a question, Mr. Rowe. Really? You got to point, you got to paint that on the airplane? He said, let me tell you a secret. If our patients would know how much Siata the Shmaya our members need, they wouldn't call Hatzala. <laughs> <laughs> we just, everything we do do, you, do, you do, do you turn left or do you turn right? Every move you do, I tell people, our airplanes, honestly, and I mean this and I believe this from my core, our airplanes do not get off the ground if Hashem doesn't want them to. Nothing we do happens without Hashem wanting it to. And, you know, we get, we see it. I think one of the things that makes me perhaps different than others is I see miracles more frequently than others do. And the miracles come in the form of all the challenges that we could have. Haters, there are haters. You know, there are people that if, you know, as, uh, as the, uh, as the uh, county attorney from Sullivan County, Great guy. His name is Mike McGuire. He signed a deal with Hatzala Air for us to have our hangar up in Sullivan County. He said, listen, you're going to need to go through the board in Sullivan County. You never came up to the hangar to see no, it, right? No, not there, no. It's actually impressive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend that you come and see the hangar up in Sullivan County. He says, you're going to go through the board, and unanimously, I believe every single person is going to approve your project in Sullivan County. We signed a lease for like 26 acres. It was a very impressive thing. And we have a hangar on an existing hangar. He says, however, when we're going to ask, does anybody have any objections? There's going to be two people that, that are going to just sit there and oppose it because they just love to hate. Mm -hmm. He says they could come up with a cure for cancer, for pediatric cancer, and they're going to say, but what about the doctors? So... There are going to be haters, but we see challenges every single day on all our missions. And it is amazing the Yad Hashem that we see that that is really just extended to us. I can think last week we were in Rome and we had to bring back, uh, there was a famous story where a young couple were on a, uh, in a bad accident in Rome and he was badly hurt and she was badly hurt and we flew them back um, from Rome. And we had challenge after challenge, and yet we saw Yad Hashem after Yad Hashem every step of the way. So I'm blessed to be able to um, be part of a team of winners, just of absolute people that give their lives for others. These ladies that's run by, you know, Abigail Eisenstadt and Bruchy Gross and so many more that they secretly carry a, a phone on Shabbos that nobody sees and they're case managing cases on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Shabbos and on the random Tuesday night or Thursday morning. They're amazing. And the doctors that run it and the finance people and the volunteer lawyers and, and one by one, we've got dozens and dozens of what I would call exemplary people. And we're looking for more. If anybody hears and they yeah. want to volunteer for Hatzala Air, we're, we're hiring. The pay is no good, but the retirement, <laughs> but the retirement plan out of this world. I want to play. Uh, somebody sent in a question to be played on this on this episode. Look at you! I know we have this this new thing called Speakpipe where people can send in questions. So if you want to send in a question to a guest, you could send it to speakpipe speakpipe dot com forward slash meaningful minute. And this is a question. So this is a question for Ellie Rogue. And that, given that you run Air Hatsala, you probably fly to all kinds of places all over the world. I would love to hear your craziest story in terms of like either the craziest place you flew to or your most dangerous mission or the craziest, um, most unlikely place you would go 
to pick up people. I'm assuming you don't just go to Israel or just go to America. You probably go to very far flung places, and I'd love to hear a story about that. Thanks for all that you do for the call. Okay, um, <laughs> I, 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 I think that's a, it's a very fair question. Um, I, I really think that it's not so much the crazy places that we go as much as the crazy stories that we get and that we do on a regular basis. You know, there's a, a, a famous family in Florida called the Fallick family. And um, this guy, Moshe Levy, who's married to Tila Fallick, he called me a few months ago that a guy was working on his balcony in Panama. And uh, it seems like I'm picking on Panama today. Yeah. But um, they have Hatsala there, and Hatsala in Panama calls us like you know many do. And I just want to say that we are really more of a B2B organization than a B2C, right? Business to consumer means a guy falls down or gets into an accident on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn. He's the consumer. Forget about whether it's a, you know, a free service or a chesed or a tzedakah. But the consumer then calls Hatsala, and then Hatsala comes in their ambulance and helps them. We're more of a B2B. So Hatsala in Flatbush... Actually, the head of Hatzalah in Flatbush, you know, Isaac Unger, called me this week and I said, fill out a form. And tomorrow we're doing a flight for him because Hatzalah in Flatbush requested. Today, we did this, we flew this baby because Rufua Helpline, right. it's, a, it's a very uh, impressive um, chesed organization that helps people with, with referrals. They called us, can we fly a baby to Cincinnati? So every day we're called by, we're more of a B2B. Yeah, Individuals typically don't call us, but rather they're local. So then um, this guy, Moshe Levy, who's married to Tila Fallick in Miami, calls us and says he has a, I think it was a family member in Panama who fell four stories while working on his balcony. But I think he fell on his legs and they were going to amputate both his legs because they were crushed and, and, and broken so bad. So we said we agreed. We said we would send a team. We typically have a plane in Florida, a plane in New York. We, we put them in different places to be able to go. And we, we were scheduled to fly, I think, two days later. And he called us up. He said, no, they're going to amputate both legs if you don't fly this afternoon. And we flew out there. We picked him up, took him back to Miami. And I heard that he lost one leg wow. instead of two. And I got to tell you something. There is a huge difference between one leg and two. I'm going to just interrupt our normal schedule program for a joke. Um, about maybe 10 years ago, have you guys heard of Pesach Krohn? Sure. Yeah. So he's he's one of my friends from Queens. Am I allowed to say that, Rabbi Krohn? You're one of my friends? He's one of my friends. <laughs> so he calls me. This is pre Hatzalah Air days. And um, he was in Israel on with his family in Yontav on Sukkot. And he tripped and broke both his knees at the same time. I'm saying this, I only say, when I say a name, it's only a public story. So he breaks both his knees at the same time. And he says to me, Ellie, you cannot appreciate the difference. He says, I've broken bones before between one leg and two. You can always hobble or stand on one. You can't, you can't do that with, right. with both his knees broken. So he asked me to escort him back and help him. Anyway, so I bring him back to New York. And he calls me up after he's back in New York. It was a flight on El Al. And he says, you know, I did research from the time of Noah. And I am the absolute, f this is the first time in the history of the world that Pesach fell on Sukkot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, thank you, by the way. That was a big mitzvah. I appreciate you laughing at that. You can take that as your charity of the day. No, it's good, it's good, it's good. So, uh, so, you know, we've, so in this case, the guy um, broke the yeah. guy was going to lose both legs and we helped and now he'll get a prosthetic leg and we've done that and we've had so many crazy cases i mean literally just this week alone for for the number of crazy flights that we've done so the direct answer to your question is um the most um impactful mission that we've ever done was during ukraine we flew uh, with the gulf stream and we landed in Yasi and Moldova and um, various different other surrounding um, airports around the Ukraine region. And we took thousands of pounds of medication and we worked with Israel and we got free treatment for families, Jewish families that were bombed wow. with broken, you know, who knows what's. 
and we took them to Israel. Israel took them in without the appropriate, at the time, paperwork, visa yeah. and paperwork, and they treated them for free in the hospitals. And you felt really good that you were, we were part of a system. We, we, we took medication and we took equipment and we gave them to the local Hatzalah volunteers that were on the ground. And it was amazing how many people called us up and said, I would like to volunteer for the mission. And people just brought everything from, from equipment and supplies and food and, and, and you know, uh, jackets and helmets and crazy things that we took. And so the context of that type of chesed, I mean, it's, you're flying into a war zone. We're flying into a war zone. And I got to tell you something, Dr. Grushko, check. He was there, right? Dr. Newman, Avishai, check. He was there. Wow. These guys, you know, picked themselves up and went into a war zone and then flew off to Israel and, and just the types of work that we do, we never know where we're going to be tomorrow. And, um, and I think we're okay with that. Yeah. Um, as we wind down this episode, I, I, want, I want to ask you, I saw recently that Hatzalah Air is involved with a Safer Torah campaign. I imagine it's to have a Torah on the plane. I'm, I imagine there, there are times when that's needed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So sure. Um, on, a, uh, on a flight into Mexico City on a Shabbos morning, um, months ago, or more at this point, it's probably over a year ago, uh, we land in Mexico City and we we got called from Mexico City Hatzalah to fly a very, very, very critically ill patient to Montreal. So again, the three-legged component. Yeah. We go from New York to Mexico, from Mexico to Montreal and Montreal back. What I didn't tell you before, and I just want to finish that thought before we get to the Sefer Torah, is when we have that middle bucket, the, the, the Bainani, right, that in between you're not sure if it's approved or not approved, what we'll do is we'll often find an empty leg and we'll say, listen, we're not going to take you and make a special trip for you. But if we're taking a patient to Florida and coming back with a team, we'll put you on. Sometimes we can add two patients together. Sometimes, sometimes we'll offer them commercial. Sometimes we'll arrange for them a commercial air ambulance. But our incredible case managers, they, they just went out of everybody. So coming back to the Save the Torah campaign, we're there. Picture this. It's 6.30 in the morning. We've got a Jewish pilot. We've got two doctors and a flight medic. Four Jewish guys. We take the patient, his two sons, and three members from Mexico City. That's all. Shabbos morning in an airport in Mexico City. And we're waiting for outbound clearance, and they tell us that our departure slot is in 62 minutes from now. What do you do on Shabbos morning, 6.30? So Avishai will go, okay, let's go, let's go. Let's make a minion. Ellie, you got a safe guitar on board? Just make fun of me. We make fun of each other. We have a good time with each other. And I'm like, nope. Then we fly from New York to Israel on a Wednesday night on a mission. And we've got 10 people on board. And now Thursday morning, a few hours in, and somebody goes, hey, Doc, you got a safe guitar on board? And we said, nope, don't have that. So I start to think, what if we could get a safe guitar on board? So I called... We have uh, Avada Rabbanim, our Rabbanim, Rav Asha Weiss and Rav Herschel Shefter. You don't like to bother Rav Herschel Shefter, even though Yumi Shefter, his son, is a, is a big part of Hatzala Air, is an amazing guy from Toronto. But we call Rav Asha Weiss and we ask him, we say, can we have a Seika Torah on board? So he says, just to have a Seika Torah on board? Absolutely not. But how often will you lay from it? So we said, listen, we never know where we're going to be tomorrow. He said, look. If you promise and commit to laning from it once a month, it doesn't matter if you take it to an Oval's house and take it into Shul or you make a minion, you could have it on board and have it. So I said, fabulous. Now, you know how like organizations and they call us, like High Lifeline called us with this shotgun case. You know, we spoke offline on it. The, the unbelievable girl that, that on Tisha Bob, and oh, that's a great story to, they, to digress. Is that the word? He asked, Can, you know, we're flying the daughter. She was in a pretty bad state on while on vacation and um he doesn't know that that she was a guest i'm saying that yeah he didn't need it well you just told me yeah just before the i that. did i did not argue at the time at all she's amazing she and her father by the way and her father was a queen's hotel member and he says can i get a ride i mean they put in a request she was a bad way in panama needed an air ambulance out of there they called hot seller air at the time we didn't know anything who he was and she was nothing and we flew out of sullivan county 
And I see him and I'm like, Nicole, he used to be a Queens Hot Solo member many years ago. I have no idea about his daughter. I didn't know anything. I need to start listening to meaningful people. Yeah. Uh, I get a good education. And, um, and the pilot sends me a picture and he says, Ellie, you got to see this. I hope everything's okay with this guy. It's a guy sitting on the floor reading from a Jewish book while he has all these seats on this corporate, you know, citation TED aircraft. And he goes, is he okay? And I go, it's Tisha B'Av. It's what we do on this holiday. And he's sitting there saying Eifa on the floor. Well, anyway, coming back to your question of um, what the Sefer Torah campaign is all about. So we said, listen, we have so many expenses that are just hard for us to cover, right? People love to give airplanes. Somebody actually just gave us a helicopter for, to, to put in our Sullivan County hangar now, which you'll probably see you know, within the next year in operation. But to try to find somebody to sponsor an insurance policy or training for the pilots or salaries, et cetera, or maintenance, you know, preventive, proactive, or reactive is a fortune of money. So some of us were talking and we said, hey, listen, we want to put a Sabatar in the campaign on, on the aircraft, but how amazing would it be if this Sabatar would be not from one guy or one team, but if the whole Klai Yisrael, since I love to say our aircraft, the Klai Yisrael's airplane, why don't we have Klai Yisrael write the Sefer Torah and be able to use that as a way to be able to help us with our core expenses in hot solar air? And what we did was we did a little math. We said at $18 a letter, there's 305,000 letters in the Torah approximately. That's five and a half million dollars. That's about $500,000 a month, which would offset all of our base expenses and would help hot solar air be able to operate in such an unbelievable way. So we started, we ran what's called the pre-campaign event just before Tisha B'Av, and we were able to sell in our first launch, if you would, um, over 35,000 letters, which I thought was amazing, run by some of our incredible volunteers. And you mentioned Fyla Kaufman, she was amazing, and Maki Pagro and Nafi Eisenstadt from within our team. And our main kick, our main effort is going to be during our service to Mechuba. We want anyone who's listening, please. We're not asking you to dig deep. We're not asking you to give $100 or $1,000 or $10,000. Buy a letter and buy an extra one for your kids or your spouse or your parents. But that would be an unbelievable help. And um, we think it's cool. And if it works well, which we're hoping it would, just like a lot of these organizations have a campaign, We'd like to do that once a year and write a safer tour on every plane. Amazing. Well, Ali Ro, thank you so much for your wow. joining us here on the Meaningful People Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. And thank you for listening all the way to the end because you know that in the end of this episode is when we just give away free stuff because we appreciate you that much. So from the Yaakov Cruz episode, we mentioned that whoever leaves a comment, I believe, will go ahead and win a Be Kind or a Tailor Made sweatshirt, whatever we said on that episode. And the winner of that is Toby Miller 260 you subscribe to our channel you left a comment you like the video so go ahead and send us an email at meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail.com claim your prize and we had also mentioned on last week's episode that if you subscribe leave a comment like the video you're entered into a raffle to win a collars and co shirt and the winner of that is can I get a drum roll over here the winner of that is Alexandra Gold 4131 Send us a message. Send us a email at meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for subscribing, commenting. And again, this week, if you're going to subscribe, comment, like this episode of Meaningful People Podcast. Again, if you're listening this far in, we've got a special raffle for you, you know? So leave a good comment. Leave a five-star review somewhere on Apple Podcasts. And you will be entered to win a tailor-made sweatshirt sent directly to you before Shoshana. So make sure to leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, and like this video. Thank you so much to everyone who watches, who listens. We'll be back at you with another episode of the Meaningful People podcast next week. And of course, we had mentioned in this episode that there is a Safer Torah campaign that Hatsala Air is running in the show notes in the description of this episode. You can buy a letter in that Safer Torah. It is such an incredible thing. I bought one for myself, my family, and maybe you should do that as well. So head to the show notes in the description. You can see how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will see you next week. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. 
You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.